Um, the topic today is Holocaust inversion. That's part of the Holocaust revisionism movement. Now, we're talking about the new Holocaust denial that's coming out of Eastern Europe and that you hear almost nothing about because it's politically incorrect to talk about it because the American government, the British government, NATO, the European Union, Israel, all our important uh, friends in the West are trying to keep it all very quiet because these are the same countries that are anti-Russia and anything that's anti-Russia has to be good. So if they're denying the Holocaust or promoting racism as a policy or blood purism, we have to cover it. That is some of the geopolitical background of all this. Um, so West is West and East is East. And um, I know that for some people we're in Isgap and for others we're in Isgap. But either way, Isgap I know is, is more. Um, but either way, because the context of this institution is anti-Semitism, I will frame it in those terms. Western European and Eastern European anti-Semitism are completely different. They're such different phenomena that I'm not even sure I don't feel comfortable and confident using the same word even for both. I once proposed Semitism as a study of attitudes toward Jews that would include everything. Anyway, in the West, as we know, it's sadly sometimes violent with bombings, fire bombings, and, and, and events. In Eastern Europe, it has so far, as we say in Yiddish and some Slavic languages, tfu, 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 been entirely uh, nonviolent. Second, the anti-Semitism in Western Europe very often comes from the far left, whereas in Eastern Europe, I don't think there is a left or a far left, it's coming from the far right. In, for anti-Semitism in the West, it's often to do with Middle East issues, and the key word is often Palestine, and if you listen to some rhetoric in France, in Britain, in Holland, it takes two minutes till we get to all the Jews are doing X, Y, and Z to the Palestinians. In the East, no one ever heard of Palestine or Palestinians. If, if people hate Arabs as they hate Jews and black people and Russians and anybody who's not one of the Aryan elite and the eyes of the elites of society, the main issues of anti-Semitism, believe it or not, are Holocaust and communism, especially the Holocaust. A number of very different scholars, uh, Leonidas Donskis from Lithuania, Ephraim Zora from uh, Jerusalem, originally Brooklyn, the late Robert Wistrich, all noticed this and wrote about it, that East European anti-Semitism is obsessed with the Holocaust. What the hell are these Jews talking about saying that there was a Holocaust and they were all, all killed? It was us who were all killed. Um, in the West, I think you'll find socially diverse anti-Semitism. You'll find intellectuals and you'll find lowlifes and drunks and all kinds. In, the, in Eastern Europe, it's mostly elitist and highly educated. Even the neo-Nazis in the Nazi marches, most of them have a university degree. The leader of the two recent Nazi marches is some kind of professor of history in a university in, uh, in Vilnius. This is a curiosity from North Wales where I spend a few months a year uh, in my so-called permanent home. It's not a pornographic picture, it's a hand. And it's of a taxi driver called Danny. Now, Danny has only one topic that he talks to about it. He's 100% Welsh. Nothing to do with Jews or Arabs or the Middle East or anything. But his main cause in life is the injustice of Israel to the Palestinians and participating in many anti-Israel events. And he thought that I was using him less than other taxi drivers, which was true for another reason. If you pay for a taxi, you don't want to talk politics. You want to sit quietly and enjoy the scenery. But anyway, one day he comes to me. He says, I bet you think I'm an anti-Semite. I said, no, no, not at all. He says, you know what? Tell me how to write my name in the ancient uh, Jewish alphabet. So I print out. Daniel from my computer, Daniel, and I give it to him, and I think no more of it. 
A year later, he comes to me again that he has a tattooed O'Neill right here. And if you're a taxi driver, believe me, the rest of your life, um, that part of your right hand is going to... So that's West European Semitism, issues about Jews, very different than the East. Now, let's turn to inversion. Um, everybody who ever followed a court case, whether it's seeing Perry Mason as kids or the Simpson trial or any other, knows that a classic defense lawyer's work is to try to turn the tables, make everything upside down, chip away at the image of the victim, the victim wasn't so perfect, the victim contributed to the troubles that led to the whatever it was, chip away at the image of the perpetrator. The perpetrator is not so bad, did a lot of good things in the same period or maybe even in the same deed, redefine the alleged crime, it wasn't this, it was that, invoke self-defense, uh, and if possible, say it was a response to something that happened earlier in that playground spirit of he started it, prove the alleged provocation, was a crime that's equal or worse than the crime that's being uh, studied or announced or accused. And if all else fails, pass a new law about the crime. That if you change the law, then everything can, then everything can be turned upside down. And this becomes very uh, vital when it's governments doing all this. Um, so this takes us now to the history of the Western versus the Eastern Holocaust, which are themselves very different history. Some scholars date the uh, Holocaust to 39, people in the Holocaust Museum in Washington to 33. There are all kinds of different datings. One thing that's agreed, not immediately genocide. It's racism, it's racial laws, it's Nuremberg laws, it's um, deportation, it's sending people to camps. Um, in Eastern Europe, the Holocaust starts on the 22nd of June, 1941, and it starts with mass murder of men, women, and children because they're Jewish, and, and within weeks and months goes to the murder of hundreds of thousands and, well, a million by the end of that year in just the Baltics uh, and Western Ukraine. Um, in the West, the Holocaust was mostly deportation to camps for murder, eventually for murder, and in the East, mostly by shooting at local mass grave sites. So Lithuania, Latvia, um, Estonia, Belarus, Ukraine have cumulatively thousands of mass graves. Um, in the West, collaborators were largely betrayers or people who worked in administration or bureaucracy or who betrayed where someone was hiding, as in the Anne Frank diary. And in the East, and we'll soon define a little more specifically what, mean, what the East means, the collaborators uh, were mostly actual killers. The Nazis used the local nationalist enthusiasts uh, as their killers. Um, in the West, rescuers, someone who hid a Jew, the righteous of the nations, tzaddike umesto oilam in Yiddish, were betrayers of the occupying forces, of the Nazis, of the Germans. Um, but in the East, the rescuers were often considered betrayers of their own people. So in Lithuania, they were considered to have betrayed Lithuanian nationalism uh, by saving a Jew. So these are a few of the very basic differences between West and East. So just as it's very different in anti-Semitism today, it has a very different Holocaust history in wartime Europe. That's a section of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line agreed on 23 August 1939. It's an oversimplification. There was an annex, but basically everything to the West was to be Hitler's and to the East, uh, Stalin's. Um, the Nazis set up uh, ghettos, of course, very soon and began um, their, their harassment and their often barbaric mistreatment, humiliation, incarceration, plunder of the Jewish population. The Soviets, while they, of course, nationalized private enterprise, punished capitalists and clerics, they treated everybody equally and they started to enforce racial equality laws. And in Yiddish humor of the time, you have one Jew saying to another, this is unbelievable, Messiah must have come already. If someone yells, Zhit parch at me in the street, he has to pay a fine. Whoever heard of that? 
So in other words, a very different scene for the minorities. Um, uh, the red lines are the Soviet occupation, the black lines, the Nazi occupation, and Lithuania, Latvia, and towards North Estonia were not immediately occupied. There was the whole trick of giving them their so-called independence for less than a year. By the summer of 1940 and the staged elections, they too were incorporated, leading to even more bitterness at their loss of independence. So the Holocaust in the East starts on usually it's 23rd of June, 24th of June, 1941, but with Operation Barbarossa, the, uh, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, the largest invasion in human history. In the three Baltic states and in Ukraine, murder broke out before the Germans got there. And who was doing these murders? By and large, it was not drunks and criminals and people after the money of the Jews. It was anti-Soviet nationalists who didn't raise their finger against the Soviet occupation of 40-41 or 39-41, depending on the location, but were very quick to start murdering innocent neighbors. And one of the ironies is that the Jewish communists usually didn't get killed because they fled with the Soviet army. And it was usually young women and old rabbis who were the first victims in dozens and dozens of locations. Now, in the, uh, the, Holo the Baltic, Baltics and Ukraine in 39-41, these, these countries had very strong traditions of nationalism and anti-Russian sentiment. There was a lot of bitterness over the occupation by the Soviet Union in 1939, or in the case of the Baltics, 1940. The propaganda coming from Berlin and from the local nationalists was that it that that the, that the, it's the Jewish it's the Jewish neighbor's fault that the Soviets are here, and all Jews are Soviet lackeys was the theme of very many posters in all these languages that were being clandestinely circulated uh, during the Nazi preparation for the invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, now, there's something that is, that is very hard to understand today. Uh, I came to all this from Yiddish and from thousands of interviews with survivors about Yiddish uh, dialects, but they always told me their life story and wartime history. And so that is, I, I became their student long before uh, getting into this myself academically. And much as traditional Jews were miserable with the Soviet occupation that closed down the Hebrew schools, the synagogues, the yeshivas, and replaced the Yiddish schools with Soviet Yiddish schools. I collect Yiddish newspapers, so the ones just before um, the switch in power in the summer of 1940 are free newspapers with 10 different opinions. And right after, the whole newspaper is about Stalin and Molotov's birthday, or, and there's, there's nothing to read in, in, in essence. But every Jew was relieved that he or she had fallen under the Soviets and not under Hitler. That's what some Christians call a sin of the heart that there was that Jewish relief knowing what was going on in Poland and further west from tens of thousands of refugees who were making it to Soviet-occupied territory in those years. In the, in the nationalist traditions today of history professors in Eastern Europe, in this part of Eastern Europe, the e pro-EU, anti-Russian Eastern Europe, uh, every professor will say August 23rd, evil, and June 22nd, good. August 23rd, when Stalin and Hitler carve up Eastern Europe with their line. June 22nd, when they were liberated by the Nazis from the Soviet Union. And here is where the two versions of history come into such bitter conflict that for them, Hitler is a liberator because he got rid of Soviet uh, rules, uh, chased out the Soviet army, restored private property in some cases, and there are these few details of killing the Jews, the Roma, the communists, the Poles, and the Russians, and, and so on. Well, that helped them get their ethnically pure countries, which is what they had wanted anyway, and, and now in some cases they had it. Now let's fast forward to the 21st century. All this was rather kept 
there was a lid under it uh, on it until 2004. What happened in 2004? A whole bunch of these countries finally made it into the European Union and NATO. I say finally. In fact, they made it very quickly when you consider that the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And um, this new history that the Soviet Union committed genocide against them uh, it struck everyone as total nonsense because th they were left with bigger populations than when the Soviets came, with institutes for their own languages. Ah, not no political, religious, or other freedom in the Western sense, absolutely true. Um, so anyhow, after 2004, uh, there was a very expensive movement, expensive with government millions being thrown at these things, um, to try to change the history of World War II in the European Parliament for all of Europe and beyond. Um, in, in 2008, in January, there was a group called Common Europe, Common History, and there are still dozens of conferences on this topic, the argument being that if we have different narratives of history, we cannot be friends. All of Europe has to have the same narrative of history. And what narrative is that? That Nazi and Soviet crimes are completely equal. It's known as, it was known as symmetry, but after this it became known as double genocide. Um, this was about five countries, uh, European Parliament members, getting together and just putting out this little resolution that nobody in Europe noticed except for John Mann, a Labour member of the British Parliament who started the cross-party uh, committee on anti-Semitism and racism, he got up in the House of Commons on the 31st of January and he said, um, these MEPs from five different countries met to launch a group called Common Europe, Common History. It has the same theme, the supposed need for equal evaluation of history, but it's really just a traditional form of prejudice rewritten in modern context. In essence, it's trying to equate communism and Judaism as one conspiracy and rewrite history from a nationalist point of view. These are elected MEPs. So anyway, there was one voice in Europe that we, we mustn't forget. Um, by June 2008, this had grown to the Prague Declaration that demanded many things. You can easily look up the original document, pragdeclaration.org uh, or pragdeclaration.eu. There's many copies of it on the Internet. It demands that all European minds consider Nazi and Soviet crimes the same something a bit Orwellian about that, all European minds. Uh, it says that all the textbooks in Europe have to be re overhauled to reflect this equality. Um, it says that millions of victims of communism deserve the same sympathy, understanding, recognition for their suffering as the victims of Nazism. Now that sounds very good. Why not? Same crime, same victim. There's a big problem with it. What this really meant on the ground was that somebody who had spent two years in prison as a Soviet dissident in Vilnius or Tallinn or Minsk is to be treated as a Holocaust survivor whose entire family was butchered by the Nazis and who was in a ghetto or concentration camp. That completely different and unequal crimes are being called the same thing in the context of this uh, declaration. And this was sort of steamrolling through the European Parliament. In 2009, the, the European Parliament accepted um, one proposal of the Prague Declaration for a unitary day of commemoration of the victims of Nazism and Communism, August 23rd. Um, actually, the, in more recent years, 2013 and 2014, the Canadian and American Congress also accepted it without people understanding what it's all about. It sounds very good, equal uh, commemoration. One. Um, one um, motivation was to try to get rid of Holocaust uh, Commemoration Day, because there's not going to be two days commemorating the Holocaust. And in Canada and the U.S., in the Congress, it was given a very fancy name, Black Ribbon Day. 
But anyhow, in Eastern Europe, you'll find museums where the theme that Nazi and Soviet crimes are absolutely equal is part of the architecture. That, for example, is the main history museum in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, and that's the president of Estonia with the president of Germany posing between the red equals brown um, iconography. That's the Museum of Terror in Budapest, where the further west you go, the more careful the outright political symbolism becomes. Instead of a, a swastika, it's the arrow cross. Sorry, it's the, um, yes, the arrowed cross of the Hungarian fascists. And instead of the hammer and sickle, it's just the Soviet star. And this brings us to Holocaust envy, which is a major motive of East European Holocaust um, uh, revisionism and anti-Semitism. These Jews have made up a story to get money, to get sympathy, and of course a certain Mr. Finkelstein's book has been translated into about 20 languages. I know that on the streets of Vilnius, it's in every bookstore in Lithuania. Anyhow, if you walk into the Genocide Museum in Vilnius, in the hallway there's this complicated, uh, huge poster that shows how there were 200,000 victims of Nazism, that's the 200,000 Jews murdered, and there were 200,000 Lithuanian victims of communism. And that victimhood includes people in prison, people sent to Siberia who came back, people who couldn't become priests because the priesthood was curtailed, and it includes all Soviet human rights abuses from 1940 and 41 and 44 to 91. So it's a miracle that they, they <laughs> settled on 200,000 for both because in the local versions, it's always communist crimes that have to have much bigger figures, but that's a museum for foreigners. And um, until very recently, as a result of our protest, the word Holocaust was not mentioned in the Genocide Museum of Vilnius. Um, in fact, there was a whole room about the Ukrainian famine, which was, of course, a terrible uh, disaster. But you see the, the motto, in Auschwitz, we were given some spinach and a little bread. War is terrible, but famine is even worse. And that's part of that huge poster of this Ukrainian lady saying to us that, uh, that Auschwitz wasn't so bad. As, and this is a genocide museum in a European Union country that gets huge funds from America, Britain, and the European Union for all this. Um, and here's a quote from the website. Uh, One may cut off all four of a person's limbs and he or she will still be alive. But if you cut off the one and only head, you send them to another dimension. The Jewish example indicates that this is also true about genocide. Although an impressive percentage of the Jews were killed by the Nazis, their ethnic group survived, established its own extremely national state, and continuously grew stronger. So this is how the, the concept of genocide is being so manipulated in European Union NATO countries, in other words, on our democratic side of the new east-west border. So one corollary of the new movement is to redefine the word genocide. And anybody who reads Lemkin's, Rafa Lemkin's original, the very famous in 1943 introduction to his 1944 book, Axis Rule, will find what we now all call the Lemkin loophole. If you ever define anything in your lives, define it, stop and move on. He defined it very clearly. By genocide, we mean the destruction of a nation or of an ethnic group. But then, in his more general discussion, he discusses other things that might well fall into it. Things that destroy the specificity of a certain culture and put the loophole there that he didn't, of course, know would be abused in this way in the, in the following century. Um, the second corollary, and this is fascinating, is to make heroes out of the killers. Now, I think that in New York City it sounds ridiculous and horrific to say that the thousands of East Europeans who killed Jews could be heroes of civilization or of history or of anything. So here's how the thinking works. You have to live there for some years to even understand it because it's so far out from our point of view. It goes like this. Everybody who killed Jews 
wanted Hitler's victory and was against the Soviet Union. And everybody who was against the Soviet Union was ipso facto a brave freedom fighter. And then if you add to that, let's take the case of Lithuania, where the murderers the first days and weeks before the Germans, the Nazis, established their authority were nationalists wearing white armbands nominally committed to the independence of Lithuania. So in that same central Vilnius Museum that got an uncritical, fantastic write-up in the New York Times last summer, 36 hours in Vilnius, uh, um, incredibly. Again, this whole topic is taboo. The American embassies see to it that the Times reporters are very, very carefully handled there. Um, so anyhow, there's a whole section, the main one, in fact, of the Genocide Museum, calling the Lithuanian activist front, that those were the white armed bandit fascist killers, heroes. Why are they heroes? Well, of course, they don't tell you that they killed the Jews or the Roma or anybody else. They tell you that they led a rebellion that drove out the Soviet army. And there's nothing that is more ridiculous. The Soviet army was fleeing from the German invasion, the largest invasion in human history. They were not fleeing from these white armed banded murderers of their civilian neighbors who had never lifted a gun or a finger against Soviet rule when the Soviet rule was there and who had allowed their countries to become Soviet republics without a shot being fired a year before in 1940. So that is how the thinking works. At Kaunas, is, at Kaunas Kovna is the second city of Lithuania and its university is in a way more famous than Vilnius University because it's very strong in English, liberal arts, has very many Western professors coming. Anyway, it has a huge bas relief and lecture hall named for the Nazi puppet prime minister of the summer of 41, Joza Sambrazavichus Brazaitis, who personally signed papers calling for uh, some of the Jews of his own city to be sent to the Seventh Fort, where they were horrifically murdered very quickly in June 1941, before the end, of, in other words, the very first week, and then signed papers for all the rest of the remaining of however many of the 30,000 Jews of Kovna to be put in the Kovna ghetto. His defenders say he was forced at that, if he hadn't, he would have been killed. And then we say immediately, that's a fine discussion for you historians, but what kind of liberal arts university in a European Union country names a room for this guy and has him as a major hero? And again, there's no American or Israeli or French or British diplomat who will dare say one word no matter how politely or meekly. In 2012, the same gentleman was reburied from Putnam, Connecticut, his remains. Uh, were, were uh, brought to Lithuania for a reburial with full honors. Okay? And um, what happened with the New York Times on that occasion is, is that a reporter came to Vilnius but was persuaded by the American embassy not to even mention this episode. Um, this is from this year. Each year there are two government-sanctioned uh, neo-Nazi marches on, the two, on Lithuania's two independence days. Now, years ago, they used to yell stuff like Juden Raus, but no more. These are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they all have, most of them have degrees and are. Um, their front banner this year, this was the February 16th, 2016, had six national heroes. Five of the six are confirmed Nazi Holocaust collaborators. The sixth is a collaborator, but we don't know that he had anything to do with the Holocaust. He started collaborating in 44. But in any case, at least five out of the six, um, the Lithuanian headline reads, we know who our nation's heroes are. Um, there were exactly five protesters, Ephraim Zorf, myself, and three locals, all non-Jews, Lithuanians, Russians. And then on the second Independence Day in Vilnius, things got a lot better. There were only two Holocaust collaborators among the 10 um, heroes. But the Lithuanian swastika 
made its appearance completely legally in front of the parliament, the, the cathedral, and all the government offices. The swastika was legalized in 2010 as an ancient Baltic symbol of light and love. The court ruled it had nothing to do with fascism, even though we see exactly who, when, and where uh, uses it. Um, now, in Ukraine, Ukraine deserves a whole separate talk. Let's just say that in recent years there's been an explosion of government investment of, of our quote-unquote allies in Kiev in statues for Stepan Bandera, whose group committed hundreds of thousands of murders of Poles and of Jews and of Ukrainian uh, civilians. Um, again, a national hero because against the Russians. Um, and in Ukraine, things can often go much further because they're not in the EU, they're not in NATO, and there's a conflict, a hot conflict going on now, so the pressure gets a lot higher for there to be nothing. But still, I'll give one example, the famous or infamous Lonsky Street Museum in Lviv, uh, formerly Lvov and before that Lemberg, the city in West, now Western Ukraine, formerly Eastern Poland, where uh, uh, thousands were killed before the Germans uh, uh, took over in July of 1941. And when you walk into the Lonsky Street Museum, you see this image of a uh, supposedly Ukrainian woman distraught looking for her lost relative who she thinks was killed by the KGB before the Russians left. And she, and that relative may have been, and around her, photoshopped onto it, are circles with numbers of alleged Ukrainian victims of um, Soviet atrocities to set the scene for you. But in fact, this is the original picture with hundreds of Jews who had just been murdered by the Ukrainian nationalists. Now, the head of that museum, doc Mr. or Doctor, I'm not sure, may he forgive me if I forgot his title, Zabili, was welcomed as a hero in Canada, uh, I think 2012 was about four years ago, and at Harvard University, and was received by the then Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Stephen Harper. Uh, two very brave uh, scholars, uh, Per Anders Rudling, and Gegor Jerosolinsky Liebe, both non-Jewish, very bravely wrote articles protesting this, and they've both suffered a lot in their careers because there was a big gang up from American and European professors. These guys must be p uh, lackeys of Putin if they're daring to. So that's the original photograph. Okay. Um, this is in Budapest where it's a completely different story. The people being honored are Hungarian government officials of the pro-Nazi government in 44 that uh, helped the Nazis carry out the deportations. And unlike these other countries, there have been protests in Hungary. So that's a very big difference. The further west you go in Europe, the more you'll see that there are some protests. Now, the uh, parliaments in Eastern Europe have codified this trend toward inversion, trend only because it's legally stopped at that point of alleged equality uh, or equivalence of totalitarian regimes, although we have seen now that it's very far from equivalence in the local sense. Um, so it started when the Fidesz government in Hungary, the new right-wing government in the spring of 2010, passed a law making it illegal to deny Nazi or Soviet genocide. So if I say Soviet crimes in Hungary were awful, horrific, but in my opinion, not genocide, only Nazi crimes were genocide, uh, I could go to prison for three years. What it did in real life was not put people in prison. It put young people off thinking critically, thinking freely, daring to examine their own history with an open mind. Lithuania had been toying with the law, a similar law. These guys were all in touch, of course, from 2009. And the week after Hungary passed it, uh, the, the uh, Seimas, the parliament in Lithuania, passed it. But um, the president convinced them that it would be better for public relations to make it a two-year prison sentence instead of three. Estonia, in 2012, passed the Valentine's Day's law that makes it a crime 
to uh, disparage the country's heroes being the Waffen-SS of 1943 and 44, and that is different in some ways than the others, uh, and if it doesn't come up in questions, we'll leave it at that. Latvia, only a year and a half ago, passed a very strict law, maxing out at five years in prison, and of course, Ukraine, as ever, goes beyond everybody. They're not in, Euro they're not in NATO or the EU. Make it 10 years and be sure. But where is Western criticism of our ally when it does? There were a few articles, and um, they're, of course, to, uh, to, um, to always be remembered. Um, so who is driving it and why? These states, the Baltics, and recently and especially Ukraine, are also areas with the worst Holocaust record in the sense of the highest voluntary participation in the actual killing. Okay, also a dismal post-Soviet war crimes prosecution record. So changing the history fixes things. And there's all kinds of motivations, and someone should write a book on this. First is, is that kind of nationalism that says, my people are perfect, we never made a mistake. Okay, so if we're proud Lithuanians, we can't have a blemish on our record, even though Countries like Lithuania have a very proud thousand-year history with a grand duchy in the Middle Ages that provided relative tolerance and multicultural freedom. Of all the heroes to pick, they don't have to pick the heroes of 1941. And if they did pick the heroes of 1941, they could pick the rescuers, the righteous, who risked everything and had to be much more brave than in the West because, as we saw, they were thought of as betraying their own country, not betraying the German occupier. Then there's good old racism and anti-Semitism. This survives in these countries very much in a belief in pure blood. And um, you have to live there to see it. I had 11 happy years as a professor, and every semester some student would come to see me privately over some very personal matter, which got me very scared. I, I got enough trouble with my own life, and I can't give advice to other people. But it was always the following. I thought I was a pure Lithuanian. My grandmother died, and she told me on her de deathbed she was one quarter Jewish. What should I do? And my parents don't even know. And I would go into my best Brooklyn accent and say, congratulations, you're a multicultural person. So anyway, all those 450 students I had have all emigrated. So they're in Canada. And this is another big problem, that the open-minded younger generations not affected by all this have largely emigrated, leaving the far-right ultranationalists in positions of political power, in the media, in academia, in PR, in, um, in whatever well-paid jobs, very often paid for by the West, that exist uh, for the elite. For, it, and this is in a way the biggest motivation because the West goes along with it, the new Cold War. Now, first of all, this feeds into the East European anti-Semitism that's there anyway. The Jews were all KGB. They were disloyal. They did it to us first. The Soviet Union deported tens of thousands of people in June 1940 uh, on economic basis. The so-called economic enemies, the bourgeoisie, the owners of shops and factories. Proportionately more Jews were deported. Proportionately more Lithuanians and Poles were among the Soviet official, but that doesn't matter. When it's the Jews, then it's, it becomes part of the national folklore that the Jews did this to us. They were the real mass murderers. And this fits in now with the new Cold War. Russian mischief among its neighbors, fear of an aggressive re-Sovietizing Putinist Russia. So the American State Department, the British Foreign Ministry, and the governments of all these countries honestly believe that this history revisionism is a very nice tool with which to fight today's Russia and today's Putin, to expose the extent of Stalinist crimes, which I think nobody would disagree with, to demand apologies and reparations, 
to point out that Germany apologized, even though it was a successor state to Hitler. Germany paid reparations. The Russians, of course, have not done that. To one of the, uh, danger, uh, the danger of a Soviet-type uh, Putinist Russia that will soon take over these countries. And then we come to the history to dispute Russia and the West's World War II narrative. Because this new narrative, in a way, rubbishes the whole Allied fight against Hitler. It's written out of history or turned into a footnote. Because the, the revised history says that in Eastern Europe, Hitler was replaced by a worse uh, regime that committed genocide. So what kind of accomplishment is that? So the fight against Hitler is sort of written out. Um, then diminished disdain of um, collaboration with Nazism, as we said before. They were against the Soviets, so they were heroes. Um, and there's a big blur in the distinction between the new far right and the center right in countries where the new far right is this elite intellectual caste of politicians, professors, journalists, artists, thinkers, writers, authors, and not street Nazis or um, uh, people who commit uh, arson or hit people. Um, in my view, anybody who makes a hero out of Hitler's uh, forces that killed innocent civilians is far right, but uh, go, it's very hard to convince any Western diplomat of that. Um, there were very, we won't have time to go through all this, there were very many honest Lithuanians who risked their careers to tell the truth. This is a history professor, but the, um, the revisionist history from the year 1998 was uh, taking it over and putting everyone else, all these other NGOs and professors, out of uh, taking away their grants. And suddenly a whole new genocide industry, double genocide industry of museums, university departments, Holocaust conferences, genocide conferences. So we've already seen how genocide has been redefined. The tables turned between um, victims and uh, perpetrators. The third element, the anti-Semitic element, that, well, the Jews were just as bad. After all, the Soviet partisans in the forest um, didn't uh, have courtrooms and, uh, and uh, prisons, and, and um, so let's go after them. This remained a sort of anti-Semitic um, trope, a, a comment, a discourse in most of these countries. Uh, except in Lithuania, where it became um, eventually government policy. Here, the state, uh, the state park where all the statues of Lenin were taken to identifies the Soviet partisans as, e as the evil party in the war. They were the only force fighting Hitler in the forests of the Baltics. There were no American or British uh, or Canadian or Australian troops, and if not for the Soviet resistance, there, one hundred percent of the Baltic Jews would have been killed rather than ninety-five or ninety-six percent. Whenever it's not a Jewish name, they happen to highlight from the partisans. It's usually Bernstein or Greenberg to use the Russianized pronunciations. But if it's something like Charnas, they always add for your help nationality Jewish. So you should know who the Soviet partisans are. Well, the most infamous uh, government bodies in the Baltic states are the so-called red-brown commissions that um, investigate Nazi and Soviet crimes and easily convince American Jewish leaders, American professors to join, and they're given royal treatment in their uh, trips to Eastern Europe. And this particular commission attracted Yitzhak Arad, who had been um, a Holocaust survivor, resistance hero, and a, a scholar who for 20 years was the head of Yad Vashem. He was persuaded by the president of Lithuania in 1998 to join. And then in 2006, that's him in, in the good old days when he used to think that he's making great progress by coming to this commission that was at a reception at my place for him. Um, but in 2006, the prosecutors found a paragraph in his own book the partisan that it said was um, pr that proved that 
he is a war criminal. The passage said that the partisan unit, not he, but the partisan unit he was in, captured a big Nazi and killed him. Well, they knew that, and they knew there were no prisons in the forest. So why trick him into becoming a member? Not because they had anything against him, because this changes the whole narrative of history. And if you look him up in many new history books and the internet, you'll see the permanent slur suspected of war crimes because he was in the Soviet, uh, Soviet partisans. Uh, the best article on that topic was written by Dan Lazar, who's with us today. So we can later give you the link or the, or the reference. That's Fania Bransovsky, one of two women who police came looking for in 2008, that's when I got involved because I couldn't remain silent when two of my closest friends, then in their late 80s, now one passed away, one is in, one, uh, Fania is thankfully healthy at 94. Um, that, by the way, is the partisan, the Jewish partisan fort where 100 Jews from the Vilna ghetto survived the winter of 43-44. It's sinking into the earth. Be, uh, being destroyed by the elements because the government regards it, of course, as a haven of Soviet criminals, not as what it really is, in my view, or uh, perhaps many people's views, an amazing testament to the human will to survive, how 100 Jews who had no training in any kind of fighting lived there and fought against the Nazis uh, together with the Soviet partisans. That's Rachel Margolis who passed away last summer in Rehovot, unable to return to Vilnius one last time. They accused her because she had discovered an eyewitness diary. So police came for them, and we won't go through the story, just to say that our response, and this is what made me an enemy of the state, was to mobilize from 2008 the Western embassies to give honor to these partisans, these Jewish uh, veterans of the Soviet partisans, and it was the first time that Western embassies then, that's before the politics changed, were honoring somebody trashed by the state in Eastern Europe. Uh, that was, by the way, um, the bravest uh, diplomat in Vilnius at the time. Uh, he's now retired, the, the Donald Denham, the Irish ambassador. When he didn't get permission from Dublin to do this, he simply paid for the banquet himself and held it at the ambassador's residence. And uh, that's the former Israeli ambassador, second from left to Riga, who very bravely gave honor to Rachel Margolis uh, against the, uh, the wishes of the Israeli foreign ministry. Um, in the last couple of years, it's been a different accusation, not war crimes. Holocaust survivors have been accused of slander for having written memoirs and written and put together lists of perpetrators. That's Joe Malamed, the head, the longtime head of the Holocaust survivors from Lithuania and Israel. He was visited by two Israeli agents of Interpol in August of 2011, and they said, we're sorry to bother you. We have a warrant from our colleagues in Lithuania. You're accused of uh, slandering nine national heroes of the country. His response, I did not nine, I have a book with 8,000 <laughs> uh, suspected murderers. Um, and that's Pinchas Friedberg, who's very active today in Vilnius. He's been called a liar on the state's site of the Nazi and Soviet Commission after he pointed out an error about the number who had saved uh, Jewish people. He has been involved in finding rescuers and on behalf of a Canadian foundation that helps them. So double genocide moved on to make a ban on Soviet and, not, and Nazi symbols. Um, and in 2009, it had those successes. And our response, this gets to be like in, if some of you may be familiar with the great Yiddish humorist who's uh, uh, 100th uh, death anniversary yacht site we're marking this year, Sholem Aleichem. Uh, he has a satire on the battle of declarations between the right and the left, or the secular and the religious. So anyway, we answered the Prague Declaration with the 70 Years Declaration. We gave it to the head of the European Parliament, and we were able to stall out the movement there. Um, but now we've run into the much bigger problem with America, Britain, and the wider international scene outside the European Parliament. That was only one arena. So what you hear, 
hear time and again now is that these are the guys in Europe who will stand up to Putin, and if all they want is to fix a little bit of history, let's do it. Okay, and a lot of this is covered by big investment in Jewish and Holocaust studies events. Think about it, the same commission that's changing the history with books and campaigns and European Parliament activities is also the provider of local Holocaust studies and provides many wonderful conferences for Holocaust teachers and scholars and museums and many foreigners get prizes, medals, honors, junkets, and so on. Um, and anyone who dares disagree is called a Putin apologist. Um, it's come to the point where someone like Senator John McCain would stand himself next to the leader of a Ukrainian fascist party, uh, knowing full well who it is, because they are more reliably anti-Russia uh, than anyone else. That's the famous uh, Yale history professor getting his gold medal from the Lithuanian embassy in Washington, which caused him to shift his opinions a certain number of visible uh, degrees. Now, Israel is in a very different situation, feeling that it really needs votes in UNESCO, in the European Union, in the United Nations. So it behaves the same way, but one can argue it has a much bigger national interest in sacrificing the history than does the West, which has really nothing to lose by standing up. Meanwhile, the good old, the good old anti-Semitism of the Jew and the gay holding up the world continues to appear regularly in Vilnius just so people don't forget the other kind of anti-Semitism. So the literal inversion that we started with is not on the cards outside Eastern Europe, but a very significant distortion of history is spreading rapidly throughout Holocaust um, stu genocide studies departments, even Holocaust museums. So your comments and questions are very welcome if anybody would like to start. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.